Hey, it's uh, Joe and Isaiah is from The Automator. And uh, today we're going to be discussing kind of, we're, we're doing a topic on using Fiddler Everywhere, which is a, the newest uh, network traffic uh, uh, observer from Fiddler, um, or from, I forget who it's from. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, it, it's it's different. The the original Fiddler, I, I still use that one. Isaiah likes this one better. Um, this one, you do have to log in to use it. But um, other than that, I think it works. You know, he he. There's some there are some good advantages to it. I'll, I'll admit to that. Um, I just have a script that I use to rip stuff out of the other one, and so <laughs> I still use the other one. But um, we're going to be discussing the difference between web scraping and API calls, and then we're going to demo. We're going to be demoing that with Fiddler uh, everywhere here. So yeah, that's right. Let's uh. So the first example we were talking about was um, wh where were we going to start? Was it with the Facebook? No, well, no. We we well. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, start with how what the interface looks the interface looks like, and then I will just go ahead and show. We're going to start with Facebook to see how the traffic looks like with and without the HTTPS, right? And later on, we will take a look at more or less a simple, very simple approach as to what we could start looking at when you want to go ahead and start doing this web data collection right so in this case uh if let me go ahead and try and uh, share my screen first oh it's shared oh it is shared. okay there we go so here uh, we have the the new version of fiddler and of course as you mentioned there are some advantages uh to using the new version particularly for me is the fact that you can uh, filter data in a way that is non-destructive. So the older version, what happened was that whenever you set up a filter, the other data was lost kind of, because if you remove the, the filter, your data was not going to come back. So <laughs> it was something that uh, I, I didn't like that. that right. Yeah. So that is something that I didn't like, but uh, the new version actually just fixes that. And basically right now I have the traffic just paused. And you can go ahead and turn it on. It usually is on by default. And then it's going to start uh, grabbing anything that is uh, web data. So usually if you have a program that tries to send data, it's not going to be captured like that, unless it is sending web traffic, which is what uh, what Fiddler is just focused on, right? Like, now, if you wanted something that did bigger, like Wireshark, right? Would, would get yeah, Wireshark is more like network traffic in general, including uh, HTTP traffic. But in this right. case, uh, you mainly, uh, Fiddler is just focused on this. Now, uh, just to give you a glance of what it looks like, let's go ahead and remove this. And let's just go ahead and open Facebook, for example. And as soon as I'm opening Facebook, you will notice all the traffic that is going on here. And the funny thing is that this is not all the traffic. So there's there's a lot of things that you're not, not looking at right now. And I'm going to show you uh, more or less what is going on and why. So if I just go ahead and set the word here, Facebook, you will notice that supposedly I only got three calls from Facebook by this refresh, this refresh page or opening page that I just did. Now, let's go ahead and verify if that's true. Now, as you can see here, the URL is showing this red mark that tells you that not everything is being captured. If you go to the settings, you will notice that you have this option to install a trust, a trust root certificate. Now, this is uh, something that I would not recommend if you don't know what you're doing, because this is actually something that is a security risk if you don't know exactly what you're, uh, what it is implied by, by installing this. But in some situations, you might need to do this. You go ahead and install your true certificate. Again, I'm not making this up. They're telling you security warning. You're about to install a certificate and it says, do not trust Fiddler root. It is something that it is, this is something that you must understand what is going on in order to install it. And I would recommend you to just make sure that you understand what is going on. In my case, I will hit yes. And one of the options here says capture HTTPS traffic. Now, let's go ahead and do that. And let's go ahead and restart our, a, um, our test here now. Seems like it kind of like froze there. Am I looking? Uh, yeah, I just decided not to work. Let's go ahead and just make sure that everything is working. Let's go ahead and try it. So if I open Facebook, 
Yeah. Now you will notice that now we have a lot of colors going on here. And if I go ahead and put Facebook again here, uh, you will notice that now I have a lot more calls to Facebook than the original three that was presented, right? So this is because now I'm capturing data that is uh, HTTPS data and Hitler is now decrypting this data to be able to look at it. And this is why it is a security risk. You don't want your traffic to be decrypted this way. And with this root certificate, that's what is gonna happen. Now, why would we care about this stuff anyways? Now, sometimes I just need some information from a website, whether Facebook or any other website. And as you can see, there's a lot of calls being made and that's what the browser is doing. Like the browser ju just got all these calls, but sometimes what you need is just one little call like this one here. And this call is being made to the API, in this case, the graph uh, QL API. And that result, whatever they come back with, this JSON result is all I need. When this is possible, when you get a result that is JSON encoded like this, it's usually way better than doing the whole calls that the that the browser is doing. Yeah, let, let me let me jump in here for a minute here. I'm in yeah. first say so. Originally, we were looking at HTTP traffic, and then you yes. said, "Hey, let's let's you know turn on the HTTPS." Um, so when your browser loaded a page, now when a browser loads a page, that's an API call, right? All of these yes. things we see here are individual API calls, right? That's so, right. Um, before they were happening, we just weren't seeing them, right? right? So that's the distinction. Just want to make sure we were clear. It's not like suddenly they started happening. They were there. No, we no. Just they, they, they're them. always there. The only thing is that Fiddler, and actually this is the thing, not only Fiddler, other programs that are not the browser would not be able to see those calls if mm. they do not have a root certificate, trusted root certificate installed that could actually look at the traffic that is going on. That's that's the reason why now we can see it. Yeah. And then, all right. So now the next thing I wanted to bring up before we we get into the weeds was if we were able to actually have seen it here, um, the data would have probably been encrypted, and we couldn't have actually. It wouldn't have made sense just to be gibberish. That's right. It would be a lot of random characters that you would not be able to make sense of because they are encrypted. Right now, when Hitler. when you use this, yeah. Yeah, it goes allows ahead. us to, to be able to see, literally see what the browser is getting back. And this is where it starts, gets really interesting, right? Yeah, because it is. Look exactly what you were doing and saying, hey, let's look at each one of these. Wow, this is this is the one API call out of all these like 100 and whatever. This is the one that really gives me the data I want, right? Right. Like, now, so there we go. So. In this case, for example, um, you can get some very interesting things like payee locations, payee rename conditions. In this case, they're empty because we're not doing anything with them. But hey, you can get very interesting information out of an API call. And this is because it seems to be that there's a page that has a catalog, a catalog of products and stuff, and you might access that information. Again, these kind of things are only seen by the browser at this point. And Facebook might have a public definition of this API that everybody could access with certain, you know, certain ways of doing it. Now you can go ahead and read the manual for their APIs, which is okay. Or you can go ahead and take a look at the traffic and just figure it out because usually it's not that hard. Um, and we will have an example of that in a second, right? Of how you might go about um, deciphering <laughs> what is going on with a website. But we will not do it with a site like Facebook because there's a lot of things going on. If you really need to do that, well, you, you might <laughs> be in for a little bit of work. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and do it with a simpler site. So say, for example, that I am in a page like Time and Date, like this. Now, they have a lot of... Uh, uh, very neat functions, uh, functionality, making this time zone converter, international meeting planner and stuff like that, time zone maps and stuff. Now, some of them might have APIs and they have, as I mentioned, an API uh, 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 documentation here that you can, yeah, you could go ahead and read it. But what if I don't have time just to read all that? I just want to do one this one thing. Or 
um, a lot of websites don't have public APIs. Yes, they're still those, using yeah. them, right? Yeah, <laughs> they're still doing it and they don't have a public one. But for example, what if I just want to do this thing? I just want to know how to do this part here with a time zone converter so that I could import the data into my application. Right, well, I just do Santo Domingo, for example, which is where I'm at. Japan, I would just take that off. And I see a time zone conversion here. And I just want to see the time for Japan, for example. How do I do that? How do I get that information? Well, let's go ahead and clear this up. Let's go ahead and uh, remove everything. And let's do that again. Let's just go ahead and let me go ahead and do this. Clear this up. Did you have a filter applied before or no? No, I did not. I was just searching for text here at the top. You can apply specific filters for everything you're doing here. For each of them, you can actually create a filter, whatever contains, and you know you can actually use is equal, does not contain, starts with, which is very good. Yeah, so contains is great though, because right often there'll be stuff you know in between, right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, but you could also filter by the method. I only want to see the post request, I only want to see the get request or the result. I just want to see failures like 504 like that. And didn't you, you tell know, me earlier, we, we have to be chatting and you said the, the Fiddler Everywhere lets you, remind you there's a filter on, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I was just, I just started up the application. I set up some filters. I had like Facebook here or something. Now, I and, and you see filters are active please clear the filters to see captured traffic. That means that the filters that you have applied didn't capture anything, but hey, there's a filter there. That's the reason why it's blank, which it was something that it was very annoying on the other version in which you started up the program, nothing comes up and you're like, what, what is gonna, and you didn't know that it was that and, you had set up a and filter. And the fact that the filters actually session. were saved between uh, yeah, sessions. sessions was, was, you end you end up your session, and then the next time you turn on your program and your filter was saved, you didn't even remember that because it was like ten days ago. <laughs> Come on, that was very annoying. But now it at least tells you, like, hey, you have a filter there. You can clear up the, the traffic, and now your traffic is back, right? So now, uh, in our case, let's go ahead and do whatever we wanted in this case, which was just check two time zones. I just do the same steps again. And the first thing I would do is just go to my traffic and filter it out. So let's just go ahead and grab anything that has time and date. That's where I would start. Now I see only two calls. Now, uh, this is something that, let me go ahead and verify something. Time and date. Yeah, it's the same information that you would get here from the search at the top. Now, um, as you can see, those two calls is basically what I would need to do in order to get the information that I need. Now, allow me just one second. Yes, so it is interesting because before I was getting some other data that I'm not seeing now. Um, it was the completion the completion uh, completion data whenever you're typing stuff, you, right? You started it after you typed the thing. So, like when you, when you were putting in the names, is that what you were looking for? Because you weren't. Yeah. Let me let me let me just let me just restart it. Let's just go ahead and restart it. And let's yeah. try that again. So I have time and date there. Let me clear it off. And I just start with Santo Domingo. I have it down here, and with that, yeah, there we go. So now I have a few calls to a page here and, and some other calls down here that I'm interested in. And the reason why I'm, I'm actually making the distinction, and this is the part that you have to be very mindful of, is the URL where the query is being sent. The first here is sent to a PHP site called completion, and you see four of them. And then one of them that is tzconversion.php, right? And again, completion and then TC conversion. Can, now, sorry to interrupt you. Can can you add in a column there? Um, like this is what I do in, in, in the version of Fiddler I have, or just move the body size over. Because that's one of the things I will use as a queue. All right. So yeah, the body that. size, you move it over here. Yeah. 
And often, mm-hmm. not, not in this case, but often it's it's the one that has a lot is the one you're looking for. But right. So in this case, would be the other the opposite one, <laughs> like right. the one that has less. <laughs> so in this case, what is going on is whenever you're top, typing a letter, and this is the part where it would be good for you to understand a little bit of what is going on with uh, HTTP requests. So whenever you're doing HTTP requests, you send three main things. Headers, which tells the server some specific information about the state and um, you know options that you want to set up whenever you're doing the call. Like for example, this is an, a very common option, the GCP, which is, you know, uh, if it is if it is compressed, you want to, you want them to send you the information compressed in a zip file. Um, parameters, those are other things that we will talk about in another video. Cookies, okay. But you can also see their raw request. This is the whole thing, exactly how the server is looking at it. And this is very important: the GET request and the URL that you're calling. This is something that you have to understand. And then in the end, if you see a new line, a blank line, and something down here, that means that you're posting information to the site. That's just the basics of it. You should take a look at that in more detail, but that's the basics of it. If you have something posted, it would show up here on the body of what you're sending. And that's what you're sending here on the top is what you're sending to the server. And at the bottom is what the server is actually sending back. Usually the server is going to send you a body. It might be JSON, XML, or just simple text. In this case, it's just simple text. And yeah, it's going to send you headers, backs, and sometimes cookies. That's just the gist of it. You should take a look at that a little bit better. And let me um, throw yeah. little, one more thing, because when you started off, you, you just if, if people are new to this, right, it'd be great. Right. You started off saying, you need to know about HTTP requests, right? Which is absolutely spot on. But what we didn't say was like, that's an API call, <laughs> right? Yes. Like, yeah. It's it is an a- yeah. Um, it is an API call yeah. in the sense of, you know, you're communicating with the public um, uh, interface with that particular server and the way how you're interacting with it is, is via HTTP requests. It's, and that's the, at the top is the, which you see right under inspectors it says request. That's your HTTP request. And then right. what is the response you get back Whatever from the, the server get. And then, and this is the reason why you have to be careful of what the parameters are. Here, the parameter is automatically set by the browser to be a zip compressed file. And the body, when it came back, if you see the raw data, you're gonna get a lot of gibberish. The reason for this is because it's compressed. That's what's going on in there. If you see this, don't worry. It's not that something is broken. It's just that it is compressed and it has to do with the headers that you set up in the call or the browser in this case. On the bottom, what does the preview do? Does that convert it for you? Does yes. That- then in this case, it would actually uh, deflate it and then it would just go ahead and show you what the data actually looks like. Um, so in this case, what you're seeing is that um, now let's take a a quick view at the request itself. And I like to look at it raw because sometimes there are some things that become really apparent. And uh, for example, the first call makes no sense to me. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other one. Now, the second call, you will see that it is being a query equals SA. And that is interesting to me because the next query is exactly the same, but with an N. You see, so that's what I was typing. Whenever I was typing in the box, I'm making uh, calls to this site. And when I select, and you will see that in the end here, the last call is Santo. I was typing Santo Domingo. That's the last part. And it was auto-completing for me. And the body that it was auto-completing, look at it. The first, it was Santo Domingo, which is the one that I clicked, right? And as soon as I clicked it, then the call was made to this other side, which is the TC convert. And what was sent to it, it was the code, it says P1 230. Just just to highlight that over on the left, if we're looking at the URLs up above, they're all the completions, right? Right. That's right. All of this. Yeah, that's how suddenly you're like, oh, it's just marked blue. And now this one here would be marked uh, in green. So that's the one that I'm looking at. And these blue here's I could mark it again, and this one would be control four. So 
Yeah. So those are the two ones that I'm interested in. The blue ones, they're interesting as well because you could use auto completion data on your own app if you want. Right. You can get this that's and you can like use it as an app. Yeah, so that's good. But in case you don't need that, you can just focus on the ones the, the, the call. So this first call was with it says like uh, P1 230. And the second call um, says again P1 and P2. So now, that's interesting because that tells me that whenever I go ahead and make calls, it just goes ahead and, so let's go ahead and get Japan and this time I'm gonna say Tokyo. And now you will see that my next call, again, I don't care about these guys, right? So this is two and this one is four. Now this time, the last one you will see again, whenever I add sites, it just adds a new P p3 p4 so now i understand how the api is working i just have to call this url um basically this iso might be and i'm not sure about that might be kind of like my reference point i just sent to them the reference point whatever it is yeah the iso if you looked it up on, on wikipedia it's it's a, a standardization a standard. code for each country and cities and stuff so yeah yeah so in this case this iso most of the time i would just send it exactly like that i would not change that but the other thing I, I want yeah. to mention here before you get into because it's it's tied with it. It's just or just you just explain it. The uh, HTTP protocol using the question mark and ampersands and the key value pairs because you're touching on it right now. But if people have never been in this, right? I will I will I will actually touch a little bit uh, deeper on that. But in this case, my my one thing that I'm actually concerned about is this P thing because these tell that site, what conversion I'm going to be making. And that 230 for me looks like a code and that tells me what uh, uh, city it is. So I know that Santo Domingo was the first one. So they're using 230 as that code. And if I go ahead and take a look at my completion data here, you will notice that each city, California starts with 224 and so on. And Santo Domingo here has 230. So I know that those are codes, city codes. So basically I could use those in any of my calls. What that means is that later on, the only thing I need to do is use this URL here and send them some parameters. The most important one being the ISO and the P's, P1, P2, P3 with their codes. That's it, that's what I'm doing. Now to touch on what you were talking about, whenever you call a script like this, you can pass parameters to it. Just think of it, think of that PHP uh, file as a big function that is gonna perform actions. Now, to that function, you can pass some parameters that determine what you're gonna do with it, right? The parameters are always being sent in a specific way. You have to put a question mark. The first thing you have to put is a question mark to specify that after that, everything is uh, be considered parameters and for each parameter, you're gonna use the name of the parameter, the equal sign, and the value that you're gonna set it to. And after the first one, which is the only one that does that, after that, every single parameter is uh, preceded by an ampersand. So, and P1, and P2, and P3. So whenever you're gonna put another parameter, you have to use the ampersand, the parameter name, the equal sign, and the value that you want to send it to. So yeah, that is something that maybe you have never got that information, um, but that's the basic idea of it. And always the first one is gonna be a question mark, not an ampersand. So that's the, the, the main thing in there. Now that we have that information, we can take a look at the body response from the, from the site. So I get one of those two guys, right? And the body is the one that I'm actually interested in. Right now, the body is being displayed as text but I have noticed by the curly braces that that might look like a JSON object. And if you select JSON, then it would format it in a way that is a little bit more readable. And this is exactly what I'm looking for. Now it is just giving me some information like the ID of the, of the city, which is very good, it's the P1 ID. Now you have the flags, what their URL is, and you can have your start and end dates and the offset to the UTC, right? And this might be exactly what you need. You can grab this data 
and parse it as you wish. And this is the, the it might not look like something usable at first, but later on, if you read it and you get some information about what exactly is doing, you might use that information to display exactly what you wanted in your, um, in your application. So again, basically I would say just with the offset, I will be better off because with the offset, I can do the calculation myself. So if I get my offset uh, for whatever time zone you want, then I just use that offset to calculate what the time would be um, at this particular point in time. So again, this is kind of like a very quick overview of how would I might go about just starting to understand what is going on in a website. Sometimes it's a little bit more complex than this. This is a little bit easy, um, but yeah, you know, this is very important information of how to, how to understand what is going on to grab it and introduce it into your, uh, into your app. Well, and the, and the thing is, we could have done a lot of this or all of it with, with web scraping. Now, web scraping, a browser call is an API call, right? Yeah. Which returns typically HTML and JSON, right? But each, like the browser, which we saw, when the browser page loads that one page, it triggers a dozen, a hundred, however many other API calls, and it's right. pulling information, and your browser reassembles it in a way that we can see it. Right, right. Um, and when you realize, when you start looking at the size of the, the data that was transferred to load that HTML page, it's often at least like a hundred times, if not more, what you really need. Like with all we need is this little let, JSON string. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at it. So basically, if we go ahead and this same website, so now you can see that now the site uh, converter.html now has exactly the same parameters that we were using on our API call. Now, if I grab this URL and open it in a new tab, I'm going to get the exact same page as I had before. But if we take a look at the traffic, now this is uh, when 299 is the last API call that we made, right? Now, take a look at when I called that website. That's 12 kilobytes of data, okay? So that's 12 kilobytes of data because what I'm getting as the return is an XML plus the JSON, as you can see here in which you will get all the information to display the website that we just saw, right? So you're getting 12 kilobytes of data, but our API call was just 500 bytes of code. Well, so, but it's yeah. 12 kilobytes plus everything beneath it too. Right, right? of course. So beside this, this uh, HTML, which is, I would say uh, in fairness, this is all I need to display the information, right? So, but beside that, it made more calls additional calls that is beside this one uh, um, Google call. Now, this is the interesting thing. The reason why I'm seeing it, I am filtering by time and date, but there yeah. was a time and date call to the app servers. So yeah. that is additional data that is being right. sent and received that makes right. the call Facebook, you know. bigger, right? Yeah, yeah it they makes the call lot. bigger, right? right. When yeah. basically the only thing you need for your application at least, it's just this uh, 500 bytes of data that might need, it, it gives you everything you need to have your app working correctly. Go ahead and copy that URL and paste it in your browser like, like we did. Right, yeah, so this part here, let's just go ahead and grab the raw data to grab that URL, just get that. And if I paste that onto the, the browser, what is gonna happen is that I just get, um, this, this is the only thing I get. So that's the difference. If you use the whole converter HTML site, you will get this pretty display of information. But basically it's that same thing with some pretty colors on it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so basically for, for a human, for a human, this is better because it is easier to understand. It is something that I might be, it is more appealing. But for an app, for you as a programmer, you might only need this and then you display it however you want. Well, and more also doing the comparison with the web browser. Can you go back to the web page version? So yes. these elements, you know, things might change on where they are as people update their website. Um, and, yeah. and then, of course, your web scraping is going to break or you have to go back and tweak it, this and that. The, the chances of an API changing, like the endpoint, like it's so rare, it almost never happens. Right, that's right. And, and this brings a discussion on um, 
uh, web scraping, data scraping, and if that's a good idea to do. Um, it, we were, right now, as we start on this thing, like a lot of people think of it as the same thing. But I think um, there are not 100% the same. And you were making some distinctions on it as well. Whenever you're doing this API, uh, sorry, when you're doing this web scraping, what would you consider web scraping to be like uh, in itself, like the concept of it? What would you say it is? Well, it's, it's typically compared to a, referring to an API call, web scraping is I'm, I'm using a browser usually, mm -hmm. and I load it. It has HTML with possibly also triggering other API calls. And, um, but it's the HTML that you're, you, what is returned back is HTML, not simply JSON or XML or, or right. similar, right? Um, yeah. Now, now, after you have the HTML on your hands, what happens is that uh, usually when we're doing web scraping is that we grab that HTML and try to find the information that we need Right. directly on that uh, HTML uh, information, which is not as efficient or as easy as you might think. It depends on the <laughs> website, right? right. That's, that's the thing is like, you know what? And Especially, that's what we want to avoid. And, and to your point, or we, I think it was before we started recording, we were talking about it. Some Sometimes you're in a hurry. And sometimes, yeah, yeah. you know what, I do, I do web scraping, like, cause it's easy. It's so fast. You know, I can get it really quick, especially with IE so easy. Okay. I can get it done and, and I'm done quickly, but sometimes I want something robust. that's going to last for a lot longer. And, yes. and then also the first thing I do is look, is there a public API? Cause if there is right. great, I'll use that. Usually they're free, not always, but usually they're free. Um, and there's documentation, which is the most important part, right? Like that's I, the part. I that's the, it out that's on my own. yeah, exactly. That's the most important thing. So, when you have documentation, a lot of things uh, get easier. <laughs> which, which now the one thing we didn't discuss, and there's a couple things um, that that I, I was thinking. Let's add on here is for the public APIs, especially often. There's two different. There's like the OAuth and then the OAuth two, which is yeah, right. much more complicated, right? And so, especially when I'm in a hurry, I use my browser to log in. If you have to log into a site, boy, mm -hmm. your browser is really easy, right? Um, then of course we have the overhead of we were discussing. However, what's really cool, especially with IE, and we're working on this with Chrome, is if you can log in with your browser and then leverage your cookies and information from your browser in your API calls, now I don't have then to do that's, then, then that's better, right? Yeah, you don't have to do with the authentication, especially right. if you're doing just personal stuff, you just go ahead and uh, okay. log in, have the, the cookies and stuff, and then just go ahead and launch uh, uh, the automation process for whatever information you really need. That's okay. Now, uh, that becomes a little bit more complex and it, with good reason when you're trying to do more generalized tools and that's and that's good that for security reasons you cannot just simply go ahead and grab whatever information you want uh <laughs> to log in in other people's pages and stuff oh, right. like that's yeah. that's exactly like like if you need a generalized tool like a tool for people to log into their facebook and see or manage their groups which is one of the tools that we have been talking about right now in that case you you're gonna find that it is very difficult to just go ahead and do those kind of things because that's exactly the point, security. You cannot just simply go ahead and grab stuff however you want. Now, um, you have via their, their public APIs, ways of doing that that are secure and easy, uh, but you have to know what you're doing programmatically. It would be a little bit more complex well, than what you think. That's what I've said. I, I, I actually, I can use the APIs very quickly. Usually it's the stupid OAuth that, <laughs> I, that will catch me up. That OAuth 2, not the first one. That's easy, but the OAuth yeah, 2 uh, yeah, well, is more complicated. I, I'm like, going to tell you why, why they have an OA2 is because the first one was being cracked. <laughs> so yeah, right. they, they had to actually update the security. And yeah, of course, they, they updating well, means making it a little bit more complex, right? The other thing is, which we should say is, the real problem is there's no standard, right? So everyone does OAuth 2, but they're not the same. Like from website to website or endpoint, they're all different in how they implement it. So you don't just borrow, hey, I, I figured it out for AutoHockey. Now I can use no, OAuth 2 on no, this side. No, no. 
No, and yeah, that's the thing. Through, yeah, everything. Yeah, of course. So <laughs> in this case, um, usually if you um, are just going to access information that is publicly available, right? Website that has its own uh, information already publicly displayed, like time and date is a very good example of it. It is just something that you just enter. You don't have to log in. You don't have to have an account. You just have to go there. If you're accessing a service like that, usually a, a, a APIs are a time saver because usually with their documentation, they're very easy to understand and use. And if you if they don't have an API, then you can use a tool like Fiddler to just go ahead and take a look at the traffic, understand what is going on, and you know. Now, now the other thing I wanted to mention, and and if you can at least just um pull it up, well, whatever, I can share my screen too. But um, if you're doing stuff with Auto Hotkey and you're doing API calls, um, you need to make make, make sure that you add uh, you do set proxy. All right, yeah. Two comma and then localhost colon eight 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 eight. Let's. Um, right. So usually, and I, I even have a hot string for it. I think I put here F proxy, which means Fiddler proxy. And it creates this little line of code for me, which uh, usually we uh, use it as a uh, if statement, because I don't want this proxy being running. It'll all actually the time. break it. If Fiddler's not running, it ends up breaking your API call. Exactly. And on the other hand, then I just go ahead and use an HTTP object, which usually I have set up already. Right. And I just set the proxy to the local host oh. and the, the, the port. This that is Fiddler what I wanted to show. With. If you could um, fire back up every, uh, everywhere, whatever it's called, Fiddler. Yep. Every, um, yep. And then show on, because on this one, the port is different, right? And where you see that. Yes. Over Yes. So basically, um, whenever you're doing the connections here, the connections tab, it tells you which port uh, Fiddler links, listens to. Now, as you can see, this new version is listening on port 8866. Uh, the version that I had was 8888 at that time. So they did it like that, not to conflict with each other. You can use both tools in different at the same time, by the way. Um, but you can change it to whatever you want, actually. You can just change it to one, two, three, four if you want. That's not a problem. So long as it is not conflicting with another application, then you don't have any issues with that. So uh, you if, again, if if, if in, so, what I love to do is actually, you know what? Let's demonstrate this real quickly here. Is go ahead and close that if you. We don't. I don't. I don't care about this. All right. Let's show how if we. You know what? If we wanted to borrow one of the uh, the time thing we were doing and drag it into the composer. Right. And oh, so right. this is the cool thing is like, look, okay, the very first so, thing I do is I will use my browser to do an action and look at it. And then mm -hmm. I'll find the API call I want and I drag it into the composer in Fiddler right. and try to recreate it and make sure that returns a 200, which means it was a good, a good call. Right. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now, in, in the older version, you have to drag and drop. Now they changed that to be a hotkey, the letter E. So you just click on one, hit the letter E, and that would create what we call a composer. Now, uh, the composer, which is here, you can actually use it yourself to create whatever call you want. You mm -hmm. set up the verb, get, post, put, delete, whatever you want, the URL that you're going to do. And if you want to set some header parameters, you know, and those two guys here, the raw and body is just a preview of what you're doing. So the only thing that you can set up is the headers and parameters. Parameters, remember, are the ones that we set up with the question mark and the ampersand signs, right? So those are your, as soon as you start putting the question mark and you say, for example, ISO equals, you know, it, it automatically creates the parameters, key value pairs down here. Now, you can put it here on the URL or do it manually at the bottom. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. The same with the headers. Well, the headers, no. The headers, you have to create them yourself here. But again, if you grab one of these guys and press the letter E, it's just going to do that for you already. It's going to just go ahead and get, and it is going to create the URL and the parameters that it sent. And after, and by the way, it's going to fill out the header for you, which is the most important thing. Now, after you have all that, you can just go ahead and execute the call, which would then give your response. Down here, you would see the response. If this is not blank or an error, it means that your response was okay. And you will see it here as well with a 200 in green, which means that your response was good. And that means that if you do this call 
wherever you are, you can actually even do it here in our hotkey by run, you know, like this and, or using a com object to set up the headers and stuff, you should get the exact same response. Okay. So basically uh, whenever you are uh, using uh, these to capture traffic and verify what is going on, I suggest you just go ahead and press the E, have it in the composer, execute it and make sure that it gets a 200 because sometimes you grab this one call, put it here and it's going to fail. Right. Why? Because you have to do some previous calls. Now then you have to take a look at the traffic, go back up and see the previous call and do this two one after the other. <laughs> what what's often you'll find is you, you were actually using something in that the later call that you got from a previous call. And so you right, got exactly. to watch that stuff. But what I'd like you to also do is go back to the composer and let's change the 230 to like 220 or whatever, right? We're going to pretend we know it. Okay, so yeah. So let's go ahead and what you're talking about is the, the, the code here. Right. So in this case, let's go ahead and close that one. This one here is one of the ones that we were talking about. And instead of 230, let's go ahead and put... Uh, well, the 230 is on the two, left. Two, let's put 231, just the next city. Let's see what happens then. So I just hit execute. It was okay. So the ID is good. And when I go to JSON here, the first code is Santo Domingo, which is 230. And the second city might be, let's see, Santa Fe. <laughs> so Santa Fe is 231. Now that's interesting. What, what happens if I put a very weird number? Let's say 999, what happens then? Now I would get a 200, okay. Let's see what I get there. I get Santo Domingo, but the other one is an empty string because this one, you know, something that it was not good. The 230 worked, but the 9999 works. Now, that tells me that this function, if you input invalid data, it's just going to ignore it. It's just going to yeah. go ahead and... Which is rare. Be blank. It is rare. I was expecting an error here. I was expecting like at least this, this thing to say like, oh, well, maybe this option here, this minus 14,000, maybe that's the code for an error that might tell you like, oh, but I'm not really sure about that because I see it up here as well. So that's which is, not it. Which gets back to using a public API it, they tell right. you what you can expect and this and that and how to detect errors. Right. And, you know, yeah. In own, this case, like, yeah, I just uh, like it looks like there is something here that it doesn't check for the error. It just gives you the, the P230 is the same as before. This the, That might, might be something else. I don't know what it is. So this is data, this random data that I don't know what to do with it. Right? Now, can so, you go back to the, the live traffic capturing? So my, right. my previous point about that set proxy that we mentioned, like for auto hotkey code or for whatever you're doing, yeah. if you want, if you're running code of your own, like the, the one you just did is at the bottom of the screen, right? Because Fiddler knows it's what it did and it tracks its own stuff. You don't have to worry about that. But right. when we're using a program that's not a browser, Fiddler doesn't automatically track it. And that's why you got to set that. Uh, it's right, sort of exactly. The, uh, the proxy. Now, there are, yeah, Fiddler. that's right. And there are some programs like this one here, like uh, Dropbox, that is sending HTTP traffic, and right. uh, and Fiddler can see it and say like, "Hey, this is HTTP traffic." But if you're doing it through uh, your own program, uh, Fiddler might not see it right away. You have to pass it through the the proxy, and then you will see the name of the program. For example, if it is an auto hotkey script, say right. auto hotkey, and the port it was actually Process. coming from, right? Now what's so. really cool, so after, so this is the normal process I go through. A, I use the browser to go do the thing. Then I go into Composer and Fiddler and create a copy of it and re-execute it, maybe try to tweak a parameter like you did with the city. Oh, look, I updated this. Okay, great, it's working. Now let me borrow that and bring it into my tool, which is usually auto hotkey. Right. I can run it and I can look side by side for the, each of those things between the browser and then when uh, Fiddler did it, and then when Auto right. did it, and I can see what's different. If my what is good, mine, what is not good, yeah. right? So it, it yeah. really helps you figure out because the other stuff, a lot of this, what we're describing here and showing here, you can do with like your Chrome networking tab, right, in the developer tools. However, like Chrome will not see the Auto Hotkey traffic. I don't, no, I don't know if you know. Right right no, 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 no. Right now, it's, but it's not being able like to that. see those two things side by side. Oh, it helps a lot, right? Of course, you're especially. Like, well, of course it's not going to work. Look what I'm sending. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's 
yeah. especially, and this is one of the things that might be good to say it, is like, especially dealing with cookies. Um, oh. There are some websites that require some specific cookies. And most of the work that you're going to do uh, by working with Fiddler and stuff like that is figuring out which cookies you really need and which ones you don't need. Right. <laughs> so right. then you start removing one cookie, then you remove oh. the other one. Oh, stop working. This is the one that I need. And I so would on. expand upon that and say also the headers, because often it has headers that you don't need also, right? A lot of times. Right. You like, use- for example, if you want to, to, to have it zipped, um, it might not work as nicely without a hotkey. So you want to remove that one. But then some sites might tell you, like, well, I will not send you information that is not zip. <laughs> so, and, you yeah. Know, and sometimes you can take it and say, hey, return back, you know, XML or return back JSON. I mean, right. that's a header, you know, thing. So yeah, so it is a header that you can set. Yeah. We, we have actually, you know, a webinar on this. I have several videos talking about web scraping, uh, web scraping versus API calls. Um, and there it's, HTTP protocol is what you want to kind of study if you want to get into this. Um, right. But it's really amazing. And, and, and again, there's another very important thing, user agents. This is something that that's going to break a lot of your API calls, I, like a lot of your I calls. told you the other day, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> my API call needed a user, even though it was a public API. I'm like, right. And it was like, what? <laughs> what's that? Yeah. So, so again, user agent cookies and headers are going to be your nightmare when you're dealing with this thing. Because if you don't do the exact combination that they're expecting or that they allow, then right. you are going to have a, a lot of bad calls. It's not going to be this green, nice 200 number right there. So, yeah, no, no. So, yeah, so that's what I do is I'll borrow, I look at this screen and then I borrow each of these headers. I mean, that's why I have a script right now that works with the other version of Fiddler. And it, I can hit a button and it grabs it all and converts it to auto hotkey code for me. So then right. I can just kind of delete row by row and go, oh, okay, do I need this header or not? No, I don't delete it. I comment it out, of course. Um, but yeah. It's... <laughs> exactly. Cool. No, but this was a very good discussion on this. I, I, I yeah. really liked it. It's very... There's anything... Uh, um, it used to be XML was like the type of, uh, you know, the way you get your data back. But now... 90% at least, I'd say, is JSON. Would you agree? Maybe even higher somewhere there? Yes. It, 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 and, and there is a reason for it because the XML, what happens is that tends to be very big. What happens is that you have to put these tags and each oh, of those tags. Yeah. So, so no, but not, not, not about the structure, but the size. So the same call, so the, the same JSON call, so this same uh, JSON response would be three times as big with XML because the, each, each, label has to be tagged with an open tag and a closed tag. And depending on the size of the tag, like one of them is just a document. That's a very long word. Document and then closing document. And then you're going to put just two letters in it. And, and just the tags might be bigger than the actual data. So what they figure out is like, okay, maybe we don't need all these tags because it adds size to the, to the bytes because each character is a byte. So, uh, they decided, okay, let's let's look for another way that is more efficient, that I send less information and do the same thing. The XML was so, it was preferred because you could have nested things, right? Now, JSON allows you to do that, right? So JSON allows you to have structure things yeah, sort of. without having yeah. without yeah. having all these tags, right? Okay. Yeah, but there, there are some, you know, you can't easily jump to things the way you can in XML. Right, you still have to loop over anyway. There's differences. Yeah, in- of course. You right. have to parse the whole string. Right. right. Yes. You have to parse the whole thing, the, the whole string to get there. But if I have to parse 500 bytes of data, it's not the same as having to parse like three kilobytes of data. So it, just the fact that it is smaller makes it parsing very easier. Mm-hmm. So, so, so again, it is just. I think like I, the I main think using a small example there. What if it's a really big, you know, amount of data? Right. Uh, it would be so, so it doesn't matter what amount of data you send, it is going to be three, five times more in XML, always because of the tags. You're missing the, no, you're 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 not anyway. okay. No, I understand what you're saying in this case. So so in your case, you were saying, like, okay, now if I have an XML that is huge, I could just jump to a specific tag you have, by well, you using say right. if you have data that's huge, right? right. It's okay. not the XML or JSON. It's if you have a very large data file, XML. Right structure which allows you to jump to very specific things very specific 
part of the document. That's okay. Now, when you have exactly the same, but in a very small portion, like even though even though you're having like a, a huge data, but the JSON file is very small, parsing it is not going to take that much time either. It's yeah, it, but it does take more, right? It just it gets back to they're different, right? And they depends, have depends on how you perf how do you take check but, the but performance. On I that, will but agree yeah. that the the size <laughs> of the data will be smaller in JSON. Yeah, yeah, right. I, that's right. for that's for real. Which is what I so, think most people on here are trying to do. They're trying to speed up that transfer. Yeah, right? because because of the HTTP transfer protocol. Because right. you know you, you you just want to send data over the internet, and the more data you're sending, the more uh, expensive it gets for you in the end. It's going to be slower. Yeah. It's going to be. Well, that's right. Expenses can be interpreted in different ways. There's yeah, yeah, process. exactly. Expensive in the sense of uh, yeah. yeah, the 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 performance particularly. Anyway. 90, 95% of data nowadays now is JSON. Back JSON. Right, yeah. Now, often you can actually, a lot of the APIs will allow you to choose and you can say, I want XML or I want JSON, right? It's yes, just, yes. And then, anyway, so I hope that helps everyone. I think this this Fiddler Everywhere does, it, I said, I, I like some of the, the new stuff with it. Um, I personally hate the- The, it's the, just, the GUI, uh, the design. No, it's not that. It's that I have to log in. It's, it's in a tool that's not, you know that I have to log into. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a services, uh, uh, a services uh, system yeah. as a service. The yeah. thing is that basically now they have these uh, pricing plans, right? And they have right. these usage limits and stuff like that. And but I have noticed that the free plan is extremely good. The personal use is good. Uh, the pricing plans is just for teams and whenever you're going to work in a team. And it's the same that happens with Postman. So Postman is another tool that is very similar to this. Again, the point is that they have these login requirements for them to track whether you have a plan that is for Teams or not. Um, but the free version for it is extremely powerful. You can use it for whatever you want. So yeah. Cool. Awesome, man. All right. Good okay. job. We're going to be talking later.